So I took the huge chance of driving across wow. the entire, you know, from Michigan to uh, Welch's to take the job and to completely go into a whole new industry. Wow. From from automotive, you know, being a product design engineer in in the automotive to, uh, you know, a retail store guide slash teacher, you know, whatever it takes to run that store. That was Barney Wong talking about what it felt like when he quit his job and drove across the country to become a fly fishing instructor and fly shop manager with a serious focus on steelhead. We are on episode number 28 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Before I get into the intro, I want to remind you to follow us on Instagram at instagram.com slash wetflyswing. In today's episode, I interview Barney Wong, a spay casting instructor and founder of pimpmycanoe.com. Barney breaks down the details of spay lines and some of the issues with the current line designations. We talk about a little, a little about an experiment uh, we did on the river and it sheds a little bit of light on the differences between spay line companies and different sinking rates. Don't miss this one as Barney talks about how he cracked the code on distance casting and tells the backstory of Pit My Canoe, among other things. So, without further ado, here's Barney Wong from a whole nother level.com. How's it going, Barney? Good, good. And how are you doing, Dave? Good, good, man. I'm, uh, I'm doing really well. We, uh, Oh, I don't know how long it's been. A few weeks since we were on the river, and we were kind of uh, d- doing a little bit of a casting lesson there. And I hadn't seen you in a, a couple of years, I think. So it's, it's pretty awesome to have you back, or finally have you here on the show and, and talking some some spay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we met about three and a half years ago when I was working out at Welch's at the fly fishing shop. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And we ran into each other, and you told me about your podcast on your website. And you were asking me about um, switch rods and oh, yeah. uh, how the switch rods uh, pertain to fishing the coastal waters. So, yeah, so we got talking a little bit. But um, after our initial correspondence, we kind of lost touch each, uh, with each yep. other until I came across your podcast and I listened to Tom Larimer's interview. Uh-huh. I said, you know what? I got to get together with Dave. You know, this is really good. I really like the concept of a podcast. There's a lot of information that I got from Tom, yeah. and uh, there's also information I want to share what I know uh, and how it could help uh, the average person and uh-huh. empower them. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And you bring a bunch of knowledge. We're going to get into this on the uh, spay lines, uh, especially you know some of the stuff that we talked about when we, when we met up last, and just your uh, your history there. You got a lot of uh, information to share. Um, before we get into that, maybe you can just kind of bring us back to. You know, I always start off with, you know, your history on fly fishing and steelhead and, and how, you know, your site, a, uh, a whole nother level, you know, where you basically you teach and you've, you guide and you instruct and maybe you just talk about how you, how that all came to be. Yeah, I think it was 2005. Um, you know, everybody has a, has a story behind why they got into fly fishing. Mine was just to keep myself sane. Um, I was going through uh, horrendous, uh, lengthy post-divorce, mm. and um, you know I needed something that kept me uh, kept my keel upright. So uh, I decided to go fishing, and uh, took my son to the west side of Michigan, and we had knew nothing at all about fishing. So we stopped by a local, you know, uh, beer and tackle tackle store. And they gave us basically a couple of rods and bobbers and um, worms. And they said, go down half a mile to that bridge, park next to it, and cast your bobber underneath the bridge. <laughs> and every time we casted our bobber, we got into a sunfish. Huh. I guess I got hooked on that. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that was 2005. And my son back then was mm, nine years old. <laughs> So that was a really good age for him to uh, get into fishing. Mm-hmm. But um, soon enough, after I started that, you know, I thought fly fishing was a more um, poetic way of uh, catching a fish, a more lyrical way. And I thought, you know, I think I will enjoy that a little more. 
and that's how I started, you know, fly fishing. Hmm. Cool. And then, and then you got into, um, and then you got into steelhead. Like, how did that? Did you kind of right away get into steelhead fishing? And then were you out here? Or and when, and when did you come out to like the, more of the northwest area? I came out to Portland in 2014. But, um, you know, going back to your first part of your question, you know, like everyone else, we started out, you know, trout fishing. So Michigan has some really great uh, trout fish uh, trout fisheries, mm-hmm. especially the Osabel. And also it has some fantastic smallmouth bass fisheries. And so we used to throw hexagenia dries hmm. to the uh, smallmouth. And I have had some of my best fishing on, on dry fishing, uh, dry fly fishing in Michigan, actually. Yeah. So well, four years ago, um, what happened was I was in the automotive industry and um, I got laid off in 2008. And that was when I said, you know what, I want to reinvent myself here. Mm-hmm. I want to do what's really uh, pulling my heartstrings. I thought, you know, 20 plus years in automotive was, you know, I felt that I was a little imposter. <laughs> I was just going through the motions and I didn't feel anything that really moved me. I felt I was dealing more with uh, people bullshit and yep. solving problems. Yep. So uh, four years ago, I saw an ad in Spade Pages, and uh, I was looking for a, a retail assistant to, uh, to work at the store in Welch's. And I contacted Mark Bachman, and, I, you know, and he sent me an email, I think, uh, f- three or four months later, saying, hey, if you want the job, it's still here. Hmm. Come get it. Oh, cool. So I took the huge chance of driving across wow. the entire, you know, from Michigan to uh, Welch's to take the job and to completely go into a whole new industry. Wow! From from automotive, you know, being a product design engineer in in the automotive to uh, you know a retail store guide slash teacher, you know, whatever it takes to run that store. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's amazing, man. That's a full on. Uh, that's definitely jumping in. I mean, driving across country and going for it. So, what was the? And you said that was four years ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, 2014. Oh, yeah. 2014. Yeah. So, so now four years, and you're not. Um, are you? You're not at the shop anymore, or? No, I'm not in the shop anymore. Um, you know, I'm working. Uh, uh, you know, at a, another school, uh, but not related to fly fishing. Mm-hmm. But you know, I did <clears throat> after the shop. I did a few stints. You know, I worked um, at Next Cast. Fly oh, lines. Oh, cool. Yeah, for a little bit. And I still did my teaching. And, uh, you know, I continue to experiment. Um, Dave, I don't think I told you, but in my past, I was a um, technology scout at Ford Motor Company. Hmm. So I would seek out new innovations and I would try to bring them while in incubation stage into uh, Ford Motor Company mm-hmm. and mature them so that they became commercial and marketable. Um, um, attributes that could you know Mm -hmm. that goes into the car um just a side story you know those you know in minivans you have those uh um drop down um screens that kids would watch oh yeah videos yeah 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 i was there in 19 um let's see um let's see 1990 1993 in uh, las vegas when i first saw them and i'm and I mentioned it to uh, my uh, superiors at Ford that we got to get on board on this. <laughs> and, um, you know, Ford being as conservative as it was, did not jump on it. And soon enough, they had to play catch up. Yep. Because everybody jumped on it. Oh, yeah. It's huge. They still, yeah. still are big, right? I mean, it, it, maybe, I don't know if I, yeah, probably all the minivans come with them standard now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So, okay. So you're basically, yeah, you, you jumped in and went for it and, and you're still fully into it. And that's where, you know, on, you know, like the spay lines, you know, where we were talking and we ran a little experiment we could talk about a little bit later on uh, that yeah. day we, we met, but maybe you could just start us off talking a little bit about like, you know, I mean, with spay lines, you know, and for, for those, there's going to be some people here that are new to it that don't understand, but I mean, this would be more for what we're going to get into. Some of this is more for people that are, that know all about spay lines and maybe kind of the upper level stuff. But, um, you know what, cause there's a lot, I mean, there's Rio, there's, I mean, there's a ton of companies out there, like you said, Nextcasters that have great, you know, lots of spay lines. So what do you think, 
is missing? I mean, do you, do you think there's some stuff missing there with, you know, on the lines of these companies or, or what do you think, you know, you can contribute or describe? Because I know we talked a little bit about that. Like you think that some of the lines maybe aren't all created equal. Yeah. Um, yeah. As we, you know, as we experienced, you and I experienced a month ago on the river, we held four different lines of uh, different uh, lines, um, sink speed. And we found that the fastest rated one s- sunk the slowest. Um, so there was this misconception about um, uh, weight, uh, total uh, weight of the line, and also the uh, sink rate that they published for each line. Um, I guess a little story here is that my discovery was when AFS, uh, Rio came up with the AFS uh, dual sink. Do you remember that? This was like I think two thousand eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of. <clears throat> yeah, I was. Yep. I mean, I've. Yeah. I haven't been totally tied into the spay game. I mean, I've been doing it for a while, but not as in depth as, as some people for sure. But yeah, I, I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So what happened was uh, I I got a uh, I think I I bought a six seven, and it was based on the total uh, grain weight. I think it's maybe four sixty or uh, four twenty. I can't mm-hmm. remember. And I remember ca- uh, casting it, and that thing would not cut through the uh, uh, surface tension, and it was a sink. It was a sink two three, and I thought this is really odd. It should be sinking at least three inches per second mm. as it's rated, uh, the tip that is. But I found that it did not cut through the surface. It would actually float on top of the surface. Oh, so I later bought a ten eleven. Rated S two S three, and I casted it, and sure enough, it you know it just you know felt like a ton of bricks, hmm. and I was wondering what was uh, what was the difference between them, and um, they both had the same color, which is I think a uh, green and gray, and um, I could not figure out why they were they were sinking slower. So remember the days of wind cutter where mm-hmm. you get all these tips. It's the same thing too. You know, you can get a, um, I think it's a six, seven, eight, and then you can go all the way to um, ten, eleven, twelve, mm-hmm. and they are different weight um, sink tips. And I also found the same thing that if I took a six weight type eight and a ten weight type eight, they will not sink the same rate. So that was my first discovery as to. Perhaps you know we could be misled by sync rate that's published mm-hmm. on the uh, line and also the weight of the line, uh, the total weight of the line. So that's that's my first discovery about that. So it lead, this segues way uh, segues way segue into another classification. While I call it um, weight weight compensated, hmm. where you know a six weight uh, sync tip eight. Should sink at the same rate as a um, um, a ten weight type eight as well. Right now, I do not believe they do, hmm. based on all the experimentations that I worked with. Um, it's almost like imagine a type eight, you know, T eight and T mm-hmm. eleven. Mm-hmm. If they were made from the same material, just imagine that the less material you have in T eight keeps it from sinking as fast as the uh, more material in T11. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think one possible upgrade, you know, that could be helpful is to have uh, what I call uh, weight compensated lines. So the heavier lines will sink at the same rate as the lighter lines for the same type, mm-hmm. class type. So... Um, I don't know. Have you played around with uh, the different sync tips and come across that yourself? No, not really. That's the thing. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you can kind of clarify, you know, as we go today. Because I think probably some of this stuff, you may, we may have already lost a few people that maybe are kind of new to the whole game. But, um, yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about just on the weights again. So, and, may, and maybe it'd be helpful to go back to square one on the, you know, the grain the grain weights and talk about the different um, you mentioned a six weight and a ten weight, uh, mm-hmm. and maybe you can just go back to that scenario again. And does this would this apply to the little experiment that we did, um, where we we let the the line sink? 
in the water. Yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll do that. Yeah. Okay, maybe you can just clarify that that little how we how we did that uh, tested those lines and then and then go back to what you're talking about here about the the six weight versus the ten weight with the same type of line, it's the same t- type eight type of line. Yeah. If um, a simple experiment is that if you take a ten weight type eight uh, sink tip and held it next to a ten uh, six weight type eight and you let both of them sink in, let's say, a pond, you will find that the 10 weight type 8 would sink faster, even though they both are classified as type 8. Okay. And, and that seems that seems just from the outside, you know, if you were, you know, a 10 weight is a heavier, you know, it's a 10 for a heavier rod, you would think that that would just sink faster because it's just a heavier, but, but that's not the case. It actually should be based on the type of line. So a, a type 8, six weight should be equivalent to a type uh, eight ten weight is what you're saying yeah that that is the uh what do you call it that's the general read that most people get when they hear about type sink types you know they think that a type eight six six weight should be uh at least giving them the same sink rate or around the same same sink rate as a um, ten weight type eight so it goes in the same way with guideline 3d lines you know, uh, I have the um, 1011, 124, um, full sink head, and I have also the uh, 89124. And the experimentation we did on the river sh- could have, you know, if uh, would have shown that the uh, 1011 sank faster than the 89, mm-hmm. even though they are both designated 124. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... A simple way of explaining to it is uh, imagine um, a fly line um, in a, could be it could be modeled by um, a parachute jumper. You have the parachute, which represents the width of the line, and that is the uh, the width of the line, you know, minus the uh, skin drag, gives it the um, resistance to sink right there. So, and then the uh, jumper, which is the weight of that paratrooper is the weight of the uh, the, the uh, flying line itself that, that's causing it to sink mm-hmm. so you have a, you have two opposing forces you have basically the parachute which slows down the sink and then you have the weight of the jumper that causes it to sink so imagine for a 10 weight line you have a you know a full-size parachute and a full-size person um, so it comes out at a certain rate. Mm-hmm. So you think, wow, okay, what's a big deal? If I go from a 10 weight to a 6 weight, why don't I just, you know, let's say for the sake of argument, let's cut the parachute in half and cut the uh, jumper in half. So you have half of each, both the uh, drag and half the weight. Mm-hmm. They should be sinking the same rate. Yep. In reality, that's not uh, what's happening. What's happening is that you're not getting – when you cut half the parachute, you're not getting half a jump, uh, half the weight of the jumper. You're getting actually quarter of the weight of the jumper. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the relationship is that um, if you half your radius uh, or your diameter on a fly line, you um, – you, you, Take basically, you got to half it one more time for the weight of your fly line. So you're ending up with 25% instead of 50% of your weight. Hmm. So you have half a parachute, but you have 25% of your weight mm-hmm. of your fly line. So you're basically starving out, you know, your fly line from any weight hmm. when you go through these divisions right there. Okay. And yeah. So you can see, you know, this is how we get this, uh, what do you call it, uh, poor, poor sinking effect. I see. Yeah, it's and, from that modeling. And so how does – so take this back to, to the somebody who's just, um, you know, going to pick up a line from, from the uh, company or wherever. I mean, wh- how can we, you know, help what, – what, what does this mean for them? You know, how can we help them um, take some of this information in and help them maybe fish the line differently or, or what would you tell somebody? Well, I think the most honest uh, sync rate that we get right now is the T-series, the T-8, the T-11, and the T-14. 
they are fixed. They are fixed at, I think T8 is 5 to 6 or 4 to 5, and I think uh, T11 is at uh, 6 to 7. Mm -hmm. And that is fixed. You know, um, you have a fixed diameter and you have a fixed amount of weight, which is 11 per foot, 11 grains per foot for T11 Mm -hmm. and 8 grains per foot for T8. But in terms of the rest of the uh, other um, uh, sink tips, such as the sink tip uh, series from um, the density compensated sink tip series, you will not get, you know, uh, the same sink rate going from one weight mm. class to another weight class for, let's say, a type 6 or a type 8. So just keep that in mind. In fact, I remember calling Rio once and the person I talked to, uh, I don't know, in a, in a momentary lapse of uh, consciousness, he just told me that, yeah, the, the heavier the, the heavier the class weight, the faster it should sink. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. And um, so that's the thing to keep in mind. Um, I'll give you an example. I was on a cowlitz on uh, Monday fishing, and I was fishing with SA's uh, S2, S4 textured uh, um, sink tip. I hung up on a uh, the bottom of a log. In fact, it was hung up so bad that my head broke off oh, from man. the running line. Yep. And I, I had to get a jet boat and extract it. Finally, you know, good thing that I could find it. Um, hmm. Then I went back and fished it with a 8-weight type 8 sink tip from Rio. Didn't even touch the log. Hmm. So here you are with a S2, S4 SA that you know, got so badly tangled that it broke off from my running line. And then you have this Rio Type 8 that didn't even touch the log Mm -hmm. at all, you know. So the numbers tend to, um, I wouldn't say lie to us, but it does not tell us the story, complete story. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah. yeah. So the great great equalizer would be a, a, what I call, you know, a weight compensated uh, designation. Okay, and that's something that, and maybe you can explain that, like, uh, you know, versus what's out there now, having the weight compensated designation. How how might that, you know, uh, play itself out? So let's say the uh, 10 weight type 8 that we talked about sank at probably 6 inches per second. The the type 8 in, uh, in, in, in the 6 weight probably would sink about, three to four mm-hmm. yeah should it be called something else other than a type eight probably it'll be helpful yeah you know yeah so just, probably call it yeah just call it a type type four instead of a type eight gotcha yeah so, so just change now the, yeah. yeah just change the late ch- just change the uh sync rate designation that's one of them now there's another way to do this you can make them sync equally fast the six weight actually would have to get more dense. You literally have to take the same material and you have to uh, compress it even further so that you have a smaller diameter for the same weight so it sinks faster. So that type four, by making it a skinnier pipe but with the same weight, you can increase it to a type six or to yeah. a, a true type eight. So it becomes a true type six or a true type eight mm-hmm. um, uh, sink sink tip. Yeah. The problem with that is that when you make it, when you make that pipe so skinny, you actually get a very limp yeah. sink tip yeah. yep. that is not very helpful in turnover. Right. In turnover, it could cause a lot of unruliness in the. Uh, in, in just the casting and the turnover of the fly. And maybe even the potentially the swing of the fly too? It's yeah, to it could, yeah. Fly. Yeah, there's a term I call steerability. You know, unable to just get all the parts of the line to line up in the way you want to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hmm. so you affect steerability of the entire head or the line system. Yeah, so that's one way of doing that. Another way of doing that is on the other end is the heavier class um, just fatten up their piping for the same weight and this way it mm-hmm. slows down oh there you yeah. go yeah okay so there's a few yeah. things a uh, 
few things that uh, that you know they might be able to do to adjust things. I mean, have you yeah. done? I mean, what have you done? Uh, have you continued to make your own lines, or how have you come up with the, solving this problem? Yeah, I, I pretty much um, recognize this problem, and um, I I tend to um, I tend to throw a lot of three D heads. And I recognize that 3D heads going to sink differently for different class weights. Um, and I pick accordingly. So if I need to penetrate a little deeper, you know, I'll go with a deeper, uh, uh, with a deeper, uh, with a faster sinking head. I would usually go with a heavier class weight. Uh, it kind of, it's hard to do, you know, to calibrate your, uh, your tips for yourself. You almost got to fish it and try it out. And yeah. then... You get a feel. That, yep, this is going to be a very. This is going to cut through, or this is just going to stay on top. That, that's what I was going to say. I, um, I had. Uh, we were talking to Tim Rollins on from uh, LineSpeedJedi.com in episode twenty-seven, and he was talking. I mean, he made the good point, and I think he had a company he mentioned, um, or a shop that has no problem send you out a bunch of lines, and you pick the one that works the best, and then. You know, you, you keep the one you want, but I mean, it basically comes down to lining your rod. I mean, you gotta you gotta maybe take some time to find that right line for the for the rod, and right. I mean, that's kind of a big part of this, you know, this yeah, discovery yeah. process. So it's not not to say that some of these lines won't work great, but it might take you some time to find the the, the perfect one for you. Yeah, that's that's definitely the different um, what I call the different sync sync rates of your tip, and also how it transfer energy in turning over your fly. As I mentioned, if it's too uh, limp, you know, uh, and unruly, it makes it difficult to turn over heavier flies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that is the tip end. Then you got the head end of the fly line. And that also affects how it loads your rod. Mm-hmm. And what I'm, um, one of the lines that we played with, Dave, on um, a month yeah. ago, it was the uh, um, Rio's in touch 3D mm-hmm. Scandi, and that was the 135 that mm-hmm. we played with. It was the uh, 1011 weight. And what happened is that the weight got pushed so far back into the rear. Um, just imagine you have a um, toothpaste tube, and you just take all that weight and you just squeeze it all the way to the back. Mm-hmm. And what I'm finding that. Um, the designs lately, they've been pushing a lot of weight to make it what I call rear, uh, rear end centric. It makes it a lot easier to cast, by the way, yep. Dave. Yep. It really does because you, you can get sloppy in your technique and most of your weight is hanging around your tip uh, when you're ready to fire your forward cast. So you, it makes it easier to cast. Yeah, right, yep. But... What happens is that you uh, rob Peter to pay Paul. And what you're robbing is you're robbing mass from the front taper, Mm -hmm. which affects your sink rate. Mm -hmm. So you get a good casting line, but you may not get the sink rate that you need. Mm -hmm. It might sink much less. So remember we played with all those lines, and that reel was the one that didn't sink the most, or sunk the less, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. That is partly because of that, because all that weight got concentrated towards the uh, back of the fly line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and basically, and just to clarify for what we did, we basically just had we had four lines, and you took um, you were upstream, and I went downstream. I'm not sure how many feet we went. Probably like what were we? Forty feet? Thirty six. Thirty six. Thirty nine feet. 36. Basically, the length of the head. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and then. And then we just sit, sat down there, and then we basically held them and dropped them, set just set them in the water, and I and I kind of watched to see which one sank, uh, you know. The mm-hmm. fa- and it, it was clear. I mean, I I couldn't tell exactly. Yeah, I mean, we I, we kind of looked at them and identified them, but yeah, I mean, it was clear there was a couple that sank slower and a couple that sank faster, and yeah, there was different. It was it was very clear that there was differences. Correct. Yeah. So the 135 was actually the fastest rated of all the four lines that Rio in touch 135. Mm-hmm. That was the one that sunk the, the slowest. Least, the least. Huh. Yeah. And, uh, but yet that had the fastest uh, sink rate rating. Okay. Huh. 
Yeah. yeah. So, so what do you tell if you were to? I mean, you've done some instruction, and you've taught some some beginners. I mean, you've probably had lots of some people that are new to it. I mean, what do you tell somebody that comes to you new to the spay game? And uh, as far as lines, I mean, what, what do you what do you give them to get started? And and do you talk about um, this this piece? No, not really. You know, most people that come for lessons, they want to get fishing as quick as possible. Yeah. So I, I set them up with, you know, or usually they come with a Skagit setup. Yep. You know, usually T11 and then a Skagit head and a 12 to 13 foot rod. I usually start them off with a double spay. And what I find with double spay is that um, it allows them to... Um, it's a cast that gives them a lot of time to correct their mistakes. Um, it buys them a lot of time throughout the process of lift, dropping, and then swing around for the forward cast. It gives them a lot of time. And also, it gives them time so that if they need to abort the cast, they can abort the cast as well without hitting themselves. Yeah. So I usually start with a you know a double spay. Okay. And... Um... And if just thinking about some common faults, is there a, a common fault? I mean, the, the tailing loop, is that something that you see um, quite a bit? And is there an easy fix for that? Um, I really don't see a lot of tailing loop. I think the biggest thing is um, this is the same one that we came across with, uh, with you yeah. on the river was combining. Yeah. Combining steps and taking shortcuts, yeah, and steps, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and I think the biggest one is um, the um, unsticking the anchor or unsticking the fly downstream. Right. Uh, yep. We tend to start with the rod about what two three feet from yep. the from the top of the uh, from the top of the water, and but if we stop if we, if we start the process of lifting where the tip is almost at the water level, we get so much more out of mm-hmm. uh, the whole process. We don't eat into our, our um, mechanical motions in just taking out tension. Mm-hmm. So much of our motion is lost in taking out tension that we end up not getting, um, we just eat into our motions that we cannot get the fly line where um, we have a lot of time and a lot of uh, motion left to uh, allow our hands to position for the firing position, and we get blocked. Hmm. So it all starts with that first that first uh, pickup, first step. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. It always starts with how you pick up that fly yeah. uh, from that downstream uh, hang down huh. right there, and it's just a whole cascade of errors that starts from that point. Yeah, and and how did you? I mean, you mentioned that you got started with some gear and stuff. I mean, what was your uh, transition into to the spay, you know, kind of the spay game? What was that like? And maybe you can bring us back to that point when, you know, and maybe, you know, when you got to a level where you were actually teaching. <laughs> it's a lot of flogging the water, yeah. Dave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just like everyone else, we try to teach ourselves. We go to the river. We watch an hour or so of a uh, real modern spay yep. cast in okay. yeah, and say, good. hey, shit, you know what? This this can't be that <laughs> difficult. We go there, we, you know, we flog and we, you know, spank the water as hard as we can. Yeah. And we think it's a lot of power that is needed. And we just wear ourselves out. And then we come to a point where we say, you know what? This has to be uh, very different because it, that's not matching what I see on the video. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you have so, did you have some people that helped you some along you know the way to get get to your level a, 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 you know, a whole, a whole yeah. other level right <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> you know I I think it comes down to uh, is uh, observation uh, you go to um, all these spay claves and the spay clinics and you just listen and you figure out what are these people doing that's you know different that's solving the problem in a different way it's a more in a more elegant and efficient way. And to me, I think every component of a cast is about solving a problem. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, picking up the fly is we're solving a problem. How do we get the fly to get in front of us in line with our target line um, in the same way 
uh, you know, how do we throw a 180 degree D loop, you know, that is 180 degrees in line with our target line. And all these components is about solving problems. And I believe, you know, that's my approach is how do we solve the problems with the least effort, with the greatest, you know, elegance, hopefully elegance and grace. Yep. Yeah. So I, you know, going back to your question, you know, I basically am self-taught for the large part. And I started migrating away from Skagit to Scandi, I think in 2008. Mm-hmm. Um, Scandinavian um, casting is a little more popular in the Midwest around the Michigan area than it is uh, in the West Coast, except, you know, most people are throwing Scandinavian Scandi heads for uh, dry fly. Yeah. Um, cast in but in terms of uh, sunk work you know um, it's more popular in uh, Michigan the Scandinavian cast in Mm. Mm -hmm. so I started approaching that because I found that I could I could use lighter lines lighter heads um, to cast um, the same payload uh, at the same distance Mm -hmm. and uh, for me what I was trying to solve is how can I connect with my fish in a way that uh, it felt, you know, like a direct connection instead of this heavy mass of PVC that's uh, kind of uh, flopping around between the rod tip and the fish. Yep. <laughs> so I'm trying to, you know, I was trying to reduce that weight, and I came across a Scandinavian casting. Okay. Is, do you see a evolution of of uh, spay for people that get into it, where they kind of start with Skagit, move into Skagit, the Scandi and then maybe slowly move into more longer and longer belly lines, getting back to more traditional stuff? Um, I definitely see one big change is at the competition casting level. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I'm seeing is that uh, the fly, the competition lines are starting to become more weight towards the back and starving out the front taper mm-hmm. a little bit. So it's becoming more of uh, of that Scandi-ish kind of design. And then my observation, whether right, right or wrong, is there's also a lot of lower hand involved in casting, mm-hmm. in competition casting. Um, I think there's also influences from having international participants show up in San Francisco and having a different style of casting as well. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I see a lot of you know um, of that influence as well. Um, I don't know whether Scandi's uh, sunk Scandi work is going to take off here, because a lot of manufacturers try to offer it to the U.S. crowd. But unless you know you can translate it as better fishing, you can translate Scandi as a better way of going about it. It pretty much did not take root here, mm-hmm. and. So let's say SA, they offered USD heads uh, for a while, and now I'm finding out that they only offer it in Europe. So, you know, in, uh, when I was working at the store, you know, you could get it four years ago. Now, oh. yeah, you could get it, but, you know, it's not something that people carry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you have to basically get SA to dig it out from the inventory and send it as a special order. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so what is your, you know, talking about rivers and maybe a little more fishing here, what, what do you uh, consider, you're up in Washington a little bit, do you fish, uh, do you have a home river that you call your home, or do you just kind of fish all the all the rivers around the, uh, kind of the northwest? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, coming from Michigan, this place is a treat, I yeah. have to tell you that, yeah. Um, you got the Sandy, you know, you got the Cowlitz, you got the Deschutes, you got the Clack. You know uh, the Clackamas, yeah. So, and then you got the coastal rivers, yeah. So it's all adventure for me. It's all about getting out. Um, let's see. I was on a Cowlitz with two other buddies. They were long line casters. In fact, one of them, you know, was second place at the senior competition for mm. the uh, tournament casting. Mm. And we just love throwing out lines out there. Yeah. And getting that fish is just a bonus, the icing on the cake. Um, but the nice thing was. Um, we were the only ones out there other than one jet boat hmm. and we had the whole run to ourselves and it's just a great feeling you know you feel so uh, you do you know all your worries kind of evaporate away 
all your petty concerns kind of get dissolved. And when you focus on that swing, it just feels um, uh, it just feels spacious inside. Mm-hmm. Nice. So uh, we I mentioned this uh, I guess before we went on there, but uh, on your website um, at uh, a whole nother level, you have some stuff on there. Um, basically, just some to reach you as far as you know if you want to folks want to take a lesson things like that but you also have a thing on there called uh, pimpyourcanoe.com and i thought that was pretty uh, interesting i i always love digging into a little bit of the background of you know some some of the guests and maybe you could uh, explain what that's all about and if that's connected to uh you know what what that is exactly it sounds pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> i was trying to convert my 16 foot canoe into a drift boat oh wow where two people could be fishing from each end, and one person could be oaring from from the center of that uh, canoe. So after I got laid off, you know, uh, I spent a whole summer just trying to come up with a concept that would work. And after slogging for the whole summer, I made it made the whole prototype out of PVC. I said, you know what, if it's going to work, if it's going to work with PVC, it's going to work with, let's say, aluminum piping. Yeah. So, you know, I took my girlfriend at that time down the river, and she survived. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so <laughs> That's cool. I'm, so I, I came up with three designs, and uh, I uh, pursued patents behind them. Oh, wow. And uh, the U.S. Patent Office uh, awarded me all no three kidding. patents. Yeah, and the funny thing was, I taught myself patent law and decided to prosecute it myself. Oh wow! Yeah. Cause oh you yeah. Could, yeah, you could yeah. you could pay a few hundred bucks probably to get a. Oh my god. Or more, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you know the saying about lawyers—they all thieves. Right. You know, the 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 quote I was getting was twelve thousand to like twenty thousand. Oh wow! Well, I guess yeah. you were at a whole yeah you're a whole other level there too. But uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, um, the last one that I prosecuted, I had a 40-page response to overcome a rejection. Huh. Yeah. Damn. So, so and what was so, – so now these things, obviously, I mean, you, you spent all that time getting the patent. I mean, what, what's, your, what's your plan with them? And, and I'm trying – maybe before we get to there, maybe you could tell me – I'm trying to picture it again. So you have a canoe that's like a mm-hmm. decent-sized canoe that fits two people. And, yep. and now you're talking about putting somebody in the middle rowing. And, correct, and correct. then also having two other people on either end. Correct, correct. So three people in the boat. That's right. So the first one I uh, pursued was a uh, pontoon stabilizer. Oh yeah. That would fold into the canoe when it's not being used, and then it will fold out. Um, oh, let's like say four outrigger. or so feet from either side. An outrigger, yeah. So that was one of the uh, things I pursued. Um, the next one was a, a rowing rig that you can drop in the middle of the canoe. And the rowing rig is interesting because it has an anchor winch that's a t- that's a connected to that rowing rig. And instead of using your back, you actually, the rowing rig can be pushed forward and pulled back with your legs. Hmm. So you're actually using leg power to assist you with your uh, oar, mm-hmm. oar movement. And then the last one was a um, multi-purpose uh, uh, foot uh, bracing system. Um, it goes in. It goes from uh, an oar brace to a uh, flat picnic table to a lazy boy uh, leg catch, so that you can snooze after you eat your steak <laughs> or whatever you cook. So it, it became that uh, uh, multi-purpose contraption. Yeah. Oh wow! And and what was the you were thinking of setting this up for uh, drifting down for like rivers or lakes or both? Yeah, actually, I, I used to go down the Huron River in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and uh, I took it out on um, the, my local bass pond. Uh-huh. And I have a funny story. Yeah. My f- first prototype, um, I was taking it up north in Michigan, and uh, on the way back, I stopped by one of the uh, rest stops. So um, my boat was slightly covered, but you could see some of it. I go into the bathroom, and I was just taking a leak. And the guy next to me says to me, hey, buddy, what you got there? <laughs> and I went, oh, shit. Is he trying to hit on me? Ah. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean by <laughs> what I got here? <laughs> right. 
<laughs> and he said, "What you got there in the back of your car?" <laughs> so, so I thought it was a funny thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he, was, so he was an okay guy. He was an okay guy. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess he'd be. Okay. I was afraid. I was afraid I had to scoot one down, you know, just to get some it, space from him. Exactly. No, that's good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you got, yeah, you got uh, all sorts of good stuff going here. I mean, we talked a little bit about the fishing. Um, you know, you love all the rivers around the Michigan, and I've had a couple of Michigan guests on as well. Uh, back, yeah, uh, Kevin, uh, yeah, Kevin Ke- Feenstra, yeah, Kevin yeah. Feenstra, and uh, and, uh, and Pete, Pete Humphrey, exactly, yeah, yep. and Pete, I, yeah, and those and those guys, yeah, yeah, cool, yeah, those guys were were great. So I mean. Other than, you know, what you fish here, do you have, uh, you know, thinking about like your bucket list, it, you know, it doesn't have to be steelhead, but uh, do you have a place in the, in the world that you haven't got to that you'd, you'd love to get to and fish before, uh, you know, before the end of the end of the day sort of thing? Well, um, you know, I, um, I'm connected with, um, LTS and they're based out of, uh, Norway mm-hmm. and some of the Nor- Norwegian rivers just look fantastic yeah you know i think you know with uh and that and that atlantic salmon yep. they they hit the fly from a long distance mm-hmm. so you really don't have to go that deep unless you know you get snow melt that you know makes it very difficult to fish except with uh, fast sinking heads mm-hmm. so yeah that would be one bucket list um cool yeah, that would be awesome yeah be yeah awesome. and then i think another one is just going for any bonefish oh yeah yeah you know, in Michigan, we used to go for carp uh, yeah. on the flats, and they call it the poor man's bonefish. Mm-hmm. And I remember my son and I once hitting, I think we got into uh, six doubles where he got a fish and I got a fish almost at the same time. Wow, that's sweet. And it was a magical, it was a magical time. You know, I used to take my son fishing every other week. We would camp half our summer fishing. Nice. Yeah. That's what it's all about, man. And we're, we're kind of... Yeah. Gearing up, getting ready for uh, summertime isn't too far away right now. So um, yeah, and and you got uh, kids too, so I know yeah. you, you think about these things. Oh yeah, yeah, it's going to be a great summer. Yeah, mine are uh, six and four now, and uh, we're we're going to be camping all summer and fishing. And this is going to be the year, man. This is going to be the year I really get them into the into the fly fishing. So I'm excited to to get out on the river. And the the biggest uh, hold up for us was you know drifting the rivers and you know, being afraid to take them through white water and stuff like that. But, oh yeah. You know, yeah. That's, but, that's, that's when you need to pimp my canoe, pimp yeah. your canoe designs. <laughs> exactly. I, I may have to look it, look you up on that one. No, that, that's, that's super cool. So, uh, so yeah, we were, we we're talking about, you know, lions and things like that. Is there a, um, you know, as far as resources out there for somebody, say somebody wanted to find out, you know, more information about either what you're talking about or just like lines in general or just spay. Is there like a book or magazine or other resources that, you know, you use or you would, you would direct people you think are helpful? Yeah. Um, I came across a lot of um, um, research articles that really confirmed, you know, certain things that I was observing. But there was a research site that used to be, I think, pinned in Spay Pages. And it was two gentlemen from the Golden Gate uh, Casting Club that had compiled a lot of data. And and I think the data would support some of the uh, findings that you and I came across. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, for instance, uh, a polyleader, uh, they found that the butt of a polyleader was sinking faster than the tip of a polyleader. Mm-hmm. And that's because a polyleader is a uniform material. It's not compensated at all. It's not density compensated. Right. So, in fact, they recommend you just, you know, why don't you just reverse the uh, tip huh. <laughs> and you get a, a much more f- um, a direct connection to your uh, fly. Huh. Yeah. So, there's that research link and i can't remember the name but that's a really good one sure it has a lot of data in that okay um another one is uh, noel perkins from uh, university of michigan he has uh, done some um um, some papers about fly lines in fact he and bruce richards remember bruce richards from uh, scientific angler i think bruce richards retired in 2009 Mm -hmm. they put together the cast analyzer that little, you know, pilot, uh, Palm Pilot uh, app oh, okay. that would measure your forward cast and your backward cast, and it would measure them and compare them and see whether they were symmetrical. Huh. And the more symmetrical your cast were, the better you were at casting 
or more efficient UI cast. And well, Noel Perkins, you know, did some uh, work. In fact, you know, one of the things that opened my eyes is that if you took a 10 weight floating line and a two weight floating line and you drop them at the same time, well, a two weight is gonna, uh, a 10 weight is gonna hit the ground first. Mm-hmm. And they both, it, it kind of is the seminal thought as to what is happening with the type six versus the type, I yep. mean, the six weight versus the 10 weight type eight tips mm-hmm. right there. So there's some seminal work that really, you know, I, I want to encourage um, uh, a person who is into spay is to really just make observations and empower yourself that, you know, um, not everything that they tell you is what it's cut out to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the next evolution is to demand something much more honest. You know, they have truth in lending. Well, we should have truth in, you know, sync tips, mm-hmm. for instance. You know, give us a real rating, you know. Um, I know that uh, uh, the lighter weights is really hard to make them sync fast. In fact, guideline does not offer the the fastest syncing um, tips in lighter uh, lighter weights mm-hmm. because they cannot make it or it's so flimsy it's not really useful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So th- so they do hit. There is a limitation as to how light can you get and how fast can you get as you move from the heavy sync tips to the light sync tips. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And um, I always I like to pop in and ask a quick one on flies um you know do you have any uh couple of patterns you like to throw on there whenever you, you hit the water first for um either winters say winters or summers you know i fish one fly in the summer yeah a, a bantam a green butt in black okay yeah it's it's the one that i got the most fish yeah so this is so this is a, yeah. a, a green butt with a and what what it's a little different take on the original green butt. Yeah, well, it's, it's a bantam fly, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, so it's uh, it's a pretty small fly, and it's in black and white, and it has a green butt. That's all. Yep. You know, the way I look at it, I think uh, is have contrast. Yeah. So if you have those chevron marks, you know, on your uh, hackle, you know, that really gives a lot of contrast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Of course, movement will be helpful, but I'm a firm believer in contrast. Um, I think that's what captures their eyes, uh, mm-hmm. captures their attention at least. You know, yep. for winter, uh, you know, I'll I'll tell you my dirty secret. I cast flies that I find in the river. Nice, that's sweet. <laughs> Bro, you just take yeah. up all that, give it a little uh, sharpen the hook, and throw it on. Yeah, pretty much. You know, that's so. Pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, on Cowlitz, um, uh, on Monday, I found this intruder in the parking lot. It was a weightless intruder, and it was a pretty sizable one. So I um, I set it up on my rig, and then while taking a break, you know, um, one of my buddies says, "Can I fish with your rod?" It was eleven. It was a sixteen foot rod with that intruder. He went ahead and cast it. Ten minutes later, hooked into um, a good nine pound right. summer run. Yeah, on, on with the, that intruder. That's yeah. <laughs> nice. And, and do you uh, and do you tie you, you tie some flies too, or do you, do you not tie much? Yeah, yeah, I I tie uh, quite a bit. You know, yeah. um, I like tying the foxy dogs. You know, but I modify them a little bit. Um, there's this fly called the meth. I, I don't know where it got its name, but it has a chartreuse, a 13 pound chartreuse mono that is twisted, uh, and it forms an extended body. So what I did was with the foxy dog, I had an extended body from the back of the uh, shank. And what I found was that it almost gave it like a, a lighting from inside that uh, showcased the silhouette of the fly a little more. And I found that to be actually very useful. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like somebody holding a flashlight in, in, in the middle of the fly. Hmm. And yeah, lighting up the fly from the inside. Yeah. Right, right. Did you see my video where I made that 10 inch fly? Uh, no, I don't think so. When you get a chance, yeah. Okay. I made a, a 10 inch fly to mimic the smolts that they release in Michigan. Oh, wow. And I made it jointed like a Rapala. Sure. Yeah, I took some Lego joints and I made, made it into a three piece fly and I had a, a diving lip to it. Huh. 
So this is the funny story. I was casting it, and it's a real bear to cast. And we were passing this one drift boat, and this guy was giving me the nastiest look. And and I realized what it was. He thought that I had hooked a smolt, oh, and yeah. I was casting that smolt in <laughs> the air. <laughs> That's so, pretty good. <laughs> yeah. But just before we ran into him, I threw that fly into this one run, and we had this trout on the ensemble the size of a steelhead T-bone it twice. Oh, wow. It was an amazing sight. Uh, huh. My guide friend and I, we we froze. Yeah. We didn't know what to do because we've never seen trout that big before. Oh, wow. Yeah. But it has some really good calling power, you know, to throw something that big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. I'll, I'll leave a note or um, in the show notes. I'll, uh, it's going to be uh, wetflyswing.com slash uh, 28. Uh, I'll, I'll leave a link. I'll find that video and put it in the show notes for everybody to take a look. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to, to look at it too. That sounds sounds like a monster. So, are you more of a so you like tying uh, fish in more bigger bigger stuff, or are you more going small? You know what i i i I try to tie something that I can um, cast without having to roll cast, mm-hmm. especially sunk work. Yeah. So I find the foxy dog is one of the easiest ones that I can get movement, but at the same time, it's easy to pick up from a long distance because some of my sunk uh, heads are about 64 feet long. Oh, wow. So there is a lot of distance to get that fly out of the water, and it tends to be pretty unruly when it gets that far out. Yeah. And then if I'm throwing something shorter, let's say – a 36 foot or 39 foot head then i can go with a bulkier fly and a heavier fly mm-hmm. so it's really matching the um, yeah. you know the the river conditions and the kind of rod and line that i'm using exactly yeah i, I know that was something that pete uh Humphreys uh, mentioned in his he loved fishing um yeah the temple dog style and he loved um fishing you know something that's not super big because he didn't want to have to you know he wanted the fly to sink so he he fished stuff that was a little sparser and uh and got yeah. on you know what i mean and as opposed to say like yeah. the uh, original uh, ed ward like the big intruder that had so much turkey on it you know he had to put uh, dumbo dumbo eyes on it to you know to sink it down um, that, that was, there's been some interesting yeah. clarifications. I think, uh, deck on, uh, you know, on the episode 20 mentioned, uh, clarified that whole Edward, you know, that, how he came up with that thing. Mm. And, but, um, no, it's interesting, man. This is what I love that just hearing the history and hearing some of the stuff you're doing. It's, it's really cool. Um, yeah, Barney, I think we're, we're getting about there. I, um, before I get out of here, I, I just had a couple of quick ones for you. Um, so, you know, it sounds like, so you're still doing some, um, a little bit of teaching and like if people wanted to, um, get a lesson, do you still do that or are you, are you still guiding? Or yep. Do, yeah. Okay. Yep. 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 I'm, I'm not guiding, yep. you know, um, that's a different ball game, yep. uh, but I'm teaching, you know, um, and I'm in Southwest Portland. I do meet people on the Clackamas, uh, okay. near uh, Oregon city and we can do some casting there or at Barton park. Yep. Um, yeah, so you can get a hold of me at my website, and you can just see a whole bunch of things, uh, like things I have on videos, flies and casting and different stuff. Mm-hmm. Cool, cool. And uh, and what do you have going on in the next, uh, you know, uh, six months to a year? Do you have any plans to launch out another uh, project or uh, build on your uh, your canoe design or you know anything else you have going? <laughs> yeah, actually, the canoe. Uh, I'm about to put some hydrofoils on them. Hydrofoils. Yeah, so that you know my five horsepower. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is my uh, on my canoe. That is. Yeah. Yeah. I want to I want to take it to like 25 to 30 miles per hour Jeez. with a five horsepower. Then the only way you could do it is with a hydrofoil because you minimize um, was it form drag and skin drag, and um, I can adapt one of my existing patents and modify that and file another patent to do now, that. And uh, the hydrofoil, so is that a thing that goes around like the skin of your boat or? Oh no, it's uh, it's almost like a T-bar that's connected to the to the spine of your boat and it basically is a wing, it's an underwater wing oh. and it lifts the entire boat out of the water. Oh yeah, hydrofoil. Yeah, yeah, totally like a yeah. um, like yeah. a, a windsurfers I think or yep. have those yep. things. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so wow. so that's one of the things. That's and then the cool. next one is 
Um, I'm getting close to hitting 160 feet with a competition cast. Then. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And uh, I cracked some codes as to what goes behind that. And, um, and um, these are very interesting things. One of the things I came across is called over the center. And a lot of times you're moving the line where your rod tip let's say using a clock face is between 11 and 12 well that sometimes can cause your hands to be blocked if you move your line from 12 when your rod tip is at position 12 to one o'clock your hands are no longer blocked you actually can get into the firing position mm. a lot quicker mm -hmm. yeah so you have you actually bind yourself time mm. right there so it's about getting yourself from being jammed up and being blocked yeah. through using you know, different um, phases of the rod load and the rod unloading. Hmm. Uh, you, there are multiple places in the rod load and or the, uh, in the rod load and unloading you could use and never get stuck with one. Uh, and, and that's why I'm trying to tell people is you can only cast as much as, uh, as far as you, um, what was it? You can only cast as well as you can see your problems. So the more you can see, the more you can observe, the more you can fix it. Yep. Yep, yep, for sure. No, that's a good uh, good point to leave it off on. And, yeah, I mean, really it comes back down to practicing and practicing more and more, and, you know, and just and keep, you know, growing and learning. So, uh, yeah, well, Barney, I think we're, we're about there. I, um, you know, it definitely was a, a good conversation. I think um, for me some of it was probably a little bit uh, – you know, I, and maybe for some people out there, maybe a little bit of the upper level stuff, but I think for, for those that were, um, you know, maybe at that next level, I'll bet you there's some good stuff in here and got people thinking, you know, um, so, uh, so no, I appreciate you, uh, you know, kind of giving the information there and maybe I can catch up with you again on, uh, you know, on the river and we can do like another experiment and kind of, uh, check back with uh, how things are going and who knows, it sounds like, I mean, you're designing canoes. Maybe you're going to have your design your own line here soon. <laughs> <laughs> actually i do all my pretty much all the lines that i use are custom yeah i take pieces from several lines and put it together to get all the attributes i'm looking for yeah okay okay yeah, yeah. so yeah you put, pretty much are cool man well um i guess uh, any uh you know if people want to get in touch with you where, where should they what's the best way to to connect with you yeah just uh, use my website you know that's not a problem you know, and okay. uh, even if you got a question, just, you know, send me a, f a contact form okay. and I can, you know, I believe in empowering and, and just one caveat. This is not me telling people what to do is I'm just sharing what I know. Yep. And it, it comes with limitations, of course, because I don't know everything. I'm just a student learning through and going exactly. through this as a journey. So it's all part of a journey. Yep. yep. Totally. Totally. No, I agree. I think it's just, uh, if nothing else to get people thinking that, uh, you know, everything's not exactly, you know, what, you know, what it says or, you know, you got to think and do stuff on your own and, and try new things. So no, that's awesome, yep. man. Cool. Well, I'll look forward to seeing you on the river. I know we're, we're going to probably hook up again sometime and, uh, maybe we can swing a few flies and, uh, and go from there. Awesome, Dave. You got a great show. Keep uh, it up. All right. Thanks, man. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Talk to you. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we cover, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 28. It would be super awesome if you could leave a quick iTunes review for the show. I wanted to read one recent iTunes review from GBCW who says, One of the best podcasts out there. Good interviews and interesting topics. I especially like the show notes on the website. Hey, thanks GBCW for leaving the review. Really appreciate it. It uh, helps to uh, let others know we're out there and hopefully gets a few other people into uh, some fish. Uh, thanks again for stopping by the show and I uh, look forward to catching up with you soon. Maybe seeing you online or on the river. Later. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.